listening to Transformation in Trials. Welcome to Transformation in Trials. This is a podcast exploring all things transformational in clinical trials. Nothing is off limits on the show, and we will have guests from the whole spectrum of the clinical trials community. And we're your hosts, Ivana and Sam. Welcome to another episode of Transformation in Trials. Today in the studio with us, we have Ole Henriksen. Hi, Ole. Hello. Hi. Uh, and Ole is a, an associated partner at Nordic Healthcare Group. But even more interesting, Ole is a health economist and has worked with market access in pharmaceuticals for the past 15 years. And today we're going to focus on how HTA changed clinical development. But before we dive into that topic, Ole, what is HTA? Many of our listeners might not know. So HTA is, uh, is short for uh, for health technology assessments, um, and it has sort of emerged from uh, from a research area within universities where um, you were researching decision aids in order to make decisions about prioritizations in healthcare. And later, during the nineties, it became a formal uh, requirement for reimbursement in in a lot of countries. And today, it's more or less the standard. Uh, way to regulate pricing and reimbursement in uh, throughout the world. So um, it's as it is a, a requirement in many markets, it's uh, it's also called uh, or sometimes labeled the fourth hurdle. Uh, so and that should be understood in connection to the three hurdles that you have in regulatory, uh, where, where it's about safety, it's about efficacy, and it's about quality. And then the fourth hurdle is then the HCA uh, process where, where you need to get reimbursement. And, um, and, uh, uh, and there you need to show that, you know, your therapeutic uh, value and uh, the value for money of, uh, of, uh, of your technology. Before we move on, uh, is this a requirement in uh, most markets or is this uh, Europe specific? This is uh, Europe specific, uh, but also outside of Europe, for instance, in Australia and, uh, and in Canada, they were some of the first ones. Uh, in Asia, you also have a lot of HTAs uh, working. Um, in, uh, in the US, it's, uh, it's, it's not an, a requirement in the same way as in, uh, in these other markets, but, uh, but it's also used. Mm. I see. Uh, and this fourth hurdle, this uh, requirement of cost effectiveness, how, how do you define that? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it used to be defined in sort of at least four dimensions. So a social dimension, an economic dimension, an organizational and an ethical dimension, where we would look at impact on the social uh, part, the economic part, the organizational part and the ethical part. Um, the most uh, the most sort of famous of these is, of course, the economic, no, the economic, the economical one, but the, but the social one is about you know does a certain technology have an impact on uh, on 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 the social dimension? So is it only for women? Is it only for poor people? Is it only for rich people? And so forth. Uh, the economic one is about showing value for money or. Uh, uh, and uh, budget impact. So, uh, so what does it cost? The organizational dimension is about: can this technology actually be implemented in uh, in the healthcare system that we have? Uh, can we handle uh, the amount of diagnostic things that we need to do? Uh, do we have the technology to implement it? The ethical dimension is uh, is quite important, and it's about: you know, is it is it fair? Do we make fair decisions? Uh, a lot of these systems are, of course, set in uh, in democracies uh, where we treat people the same; they pay the same taxes. Um, so, um, so it's quite important that uh, to, to have some definitions about when do you say no? When is it fair to say no to a new uh, therapy that could basically save lives? Um, so, uh, so that's the ethical part of it. Um, we uh, we use. Um, and on especially that one, uh, there's uh, 
there are problems about finding sort of a common scale on, on how we measure health uh, in order to ensure that we actually uh, treat people in the same way. Um, and that's that's how the, the I think many people know is about the quality adjusted life years or the quality. And a lot of uh, systems they have adopted uh, this uh, this endpoint of quality adjusted life years in order to ensure that they uh, when they say no, they say no on the same grounds as in any other disease. Because how do you how do you actually compare two disease outcomes if you uh, if you have a technology that uh, there could be a vaccine against malaria? And uh, and some therapy uh, uh, that treats uh, uh, rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Then uh, how do you how do you ensure that you treat people the same way uh, as if they had the same health problem because they didn't really? But you need to find this common scale. And there, the quality uh, adjusted life years have have become sort of the standard. But there are there's other ways of doing this. And Ole, is that that does happen a lot? that governments say no to adopting a new medicine because they deem that it, it's not worth it given this score? I think, um, I mean, in the in the systems I know best, uh, it's uh, in the ones that say no the most, it's like 40% no. Uh, in uh, in other systems, it can be 20, but but there are quite a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, of therapies where, where the final outcome of, uh, of the health technology assessment is, uh, is a no, um, usually uh, because it's, it's deemed not to be cost effective. Um, in other cases, it can be that it, it's shown not to be better than what we already have. So the standard of care uh, that you would compare a new uh, drug or, uh, or device to. Well, it sounds like it's a very important assessment to understand for life science companies, because here we are trying to develop uh, novel drugs, but if we can't get through this fourth hurdle, then it's all useless and we'll never get to get it to the patients. Exactly. So, um, so therefore, uh, I mean, there's a lot of lot of te technology that has been uh, developed in order to uh, to ensure that you can you know inform these kind of decisions uh, when uh, uh, when they're needed because uh, because these decisions are uh, you know they uh, yeah they are hurdle to market access so uh, so you don't get market access meaning that you don't get return on your investment if you uh, if you if you fail in these processes and all the I know that you are an economist, uh, and is this usually something that is conducted by economists like yourself? Yes, I mean, usually you would work together as a team with uh, an economist, at least, or uh, economists, uh, and uh, and then with uh, with typically a, a medical uh, a medical doctor um, in order to because uh, there's there's always a medical assessment and the and an economic assessment. So, um, but I think most most people who work in, uh, in the sort of market access part of, of the companies have uh, are skilled in uh, in health economics. Mm. So, and and what are some of the methodologies or tools that would be used to to make these assessments? So, um, so I mean, the the main the main part is that um, you can say that in in health technology assessments. The, the decision question that you need to inform with these uh, with these uh, techniques is that um, should we actually adopt the technology as part of the standard of care that we have today? That means reimbursing it uh, in most markets. And of course, there's there's several soft questions to that, but um, but but they're very concerned with uh, with what we already have in our market today. So, um, so health technology assessments is always about the relative value of, uh, of, of a new um, technology. And therefore, of course, uh, as there are many, many trials that, uh, that and, and, and that's where you start with the trial, um, there are many trials that are not controlled by, uh, by the right uh, comparator or, uh, or the standard of care used in the specific market. And there can also be uh, trials that are one-armed or placebo-controlled, where you would actually have an active uh, uh, therapy in clinical practice. So therefore, a lot of the 
development around the methodology in this has, has been in, in trying to assess um, what is the relative uh, efficacy or effectiveness uh, between therapies where we uh, don't have a head-to-head -head study. Mm. So it's, uh, it's trying to understand something that is in fact apples and oranges and see how they compare to each other. Yeah, you can say so, but I mean, they're not apple, apple and oranges, but, uh, but I mean, they're, they're treating the same population, right? or the same patient, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the same patients. But, um, uh, and in, in some cases, if you have a placebo controlled tr uh, trial, for instance, you know a lot about those patients and whether they were the same as in another placebo controlled trial, and therefore you can make these comparisons. Um, but 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 clearly, uh, I mean, it is statistics, and as such, uh, um, it is not the it is not the um, it's not the same as a head to head trial. Mm. And and knowing that we have this fourth hurdle where we will be compared against the other clinical options, how can we oh. take that knowledge and design our clinical trials in a way so we can actually get the data that we need? Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, I think historically, uh, this the fact that we got this fourth hurdle uh, actually impacted clinical development quite a lot. And the first of all, first of them is, of course, that we saw more active controlled uh, trials. Um, so, um, as uh, as developers uh, learned that uh, that that they're going to be compared uh, afterwards, we uh, you can you can build them in from uh, from the beginning. Um, there's a lot of advice that you can seek also from uh, from uh, health technology assessment uh, uh, groups or, uh, or authorities um, that you would seek in the same way as you seek uh, information from uh, or advice from uh, from regulatory uh, authorities, and you could do that in in this, in the same go in sort of a common process in Europe. Um, and uh, that goes to uh, to assess what is actually the clinical practice that uh, that a certain new drug or uh, or other technology would be uh, compared to in different markets. And it doesn't have to be the same in all markets, so it's very difficult to do one trial with one comparator that actually includes all markets, all relevant uh, clinical practices throughout the world. That's probably impossible. So therefore, you still need these techniques in order to adjust. Uh, and see, you know, what is what is the estimated uh, relative uh, efficacy between uh, between uh, your therapy and another one uh, for certain markets. Mm. So, secondly, um, I mean, the main concern or the main question uh, that is uh, that is posed uh, by HTA uh, authorities is how will this actually work in our clinical practice? Um, so what we get out of a, a clinical trial is usually what we call efficacy. Mm. Um, what HTA uh, is concerned about is, is what they call effectiveness. So it's called cost effectiveness, for instance. Um, and uh, you can say that the efficacy part is to show uh, the isolated effect of, uh, of of the technology that you are you are assessing, so showing the the effect of of a new therapy for a certain patient population, um, and there you want to control in such a way that you are you that that you have basically no other things that are that are that are varied than whether you get the intervention or whether you get the control arm. Um, in, uh, in, in the effectiveness domain or the sort of the clinical practice domain, we, I mean, you will have a lot of different patients coming in. There's no in or, or exclusion criteria that, uh, that apply necessarily, at least. Um, so, um, so you're developing or you're trying to, uh, to inform a decision about how will it work in the real world. Uh, and that's a different uh, thing than uh, than a controlled clinical trial environment where you're seeing patients a lot in order to assess whether they respond, whether they have uh, uh, side effects, whether they um, uh, should be dose uh, reduced or uh, have that dose adjusting. So um, so that's a, that's a big difference. <clears throat> yeah, I guess but it's I also think, the difference yeah. between having a, a very narrowly defined and groomed uh, population and then the broader uh, actual patient population. 
Exactly. And uh, and you're trying to assess what would the effect be on uh, on the broader population uh, when you're going into the HTA, uh, to the analysis you're doing for the HTA. Uh, and of course, there you would also, if you have real world evidence on how it works, then you would use that evidence a lot. Um, so, um, but I think also this is fed back to to clinical development. So we're seeing trials with the with less strict uh, in and exclusion uh, criteria, uh, um, and we've seen that uh, developing uh, as uh, as ACA has has, uh, has become more and more important. So, uh, so I think the development has has changed a bit in this sense, and uh, I'm quite sure that it will in the future also. How important is real world evidence for uh, your HTA assessment? I mean, that's that's where I, you you would still have the same evidence um, uh, hierarchy as uh, as is used uh, in you know developing clinical guidelines where you would you would like to have clinically controlled trials, and they had the highest uh, sort of scientific power. But the real world evidence as, as what you're trying to make decisions about is the real world. Then real world evidence is quite important um, because it also says something about, uh, for instance, the organizational uh, dimension of, uh, of, uh, of HTA. So how does, how does the healthcare system actually implement uh, this uh, new uh, um, uh, technology is quite important. So you, you've had, um, you've also had, I mean, as I alluded to in the beginning, with the quality adjusted life here, you also have had a huge impact on, uh, on um, inclusion of patient reported outcomes in, uh, in trials. So, uh, so now I think it's very seldom that we see trials uh, that does not have patient reported outcomes. And usually they would have, you know, one, general one that can be used to uh, to show um, uh, quality adjusted life here so it would be valid across different disease areas then you would have a disease specific one and in many cases also a, a therapy specific one that can be used to assess uh, quality of life of life uh, versus uh, other therapies that are the same type of therapies and uh, and of course also within the, the specific patient group and that is interesting it's it's impacted by in broadening the kinds of data that we need to assess uh, for the clinical trials, but also uh, actually pushed us towards more patient-centric data collection. Yes, you can say so. And I mean, because the decision problem, again, in HTA is actually trying to make a decision on behalf of the patient, right? So, uh, so of course, the doctor does that every day. Um, but uh, because I don't know exactly what needs to be done given, you know, a lot of blood samples. Um, but um, but on a societal level, uh, with reimbursement decisions, decisions are basically made on behalf of, that's what you're trying to mimic, is to say, you know, would the average citizen actually accept this as a good value for money, for instance? So, um, so it's very important with, uh, with the patient-centric part of it and... Uh, and it's definitely more powerful to have a trial where it was included instead of trying to uh, to uh, to to assess quality of life without having it in your trial, right? So, um, so, um, so that's that's actually a more patient centric way of uh, doing things. But there's also a whole uh, democratic dimension of this, trying to understand what is it that the people want, and trying to make uh, logical trade offs on their behalf. Yes, I think so, and uh, and I mean it's it comes back to this ethical dimension about treating people the same, no matter what their health problem really is. Um, that has been a huge part of uh, of the development of uh, of HTA. So um, and it's it's of course a big challenge, um, and in a lot of cases you would have you would have systems that would state up front that uh, they are more concerned with the uh, with therapies that can extend life for patients who have a very low life expectancy, for instance. Um, so that would be what we would call a higher willingness to pay. So, uh, so they would actually look less at cost effectiveness in situations where it's about the here and now extension of life. Um, 
as opposed to let's say again a vaccine for uh, for something that uh, that would have an impact on on your life maybe 15 years from now um, or te- technology that would have that. Do you have any examples of some difficult trade-offs that have been made based on a health technology assessment? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I think there are many, but uh, but I mean, it's one thing that's interesting is that uh, that every time every time it's a no, uh, decisions they take longer. So there's 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 more analysis, there's more assessment. There's more negotiations. Uh, the, everything takes takes longer. Whenever it's a no, so I mean, whenever somebody a, a patient group is because they're basically rationed here, right? Um, then decisions are much more thoroughly uh, uh, assessed. Uh, you can say, but there are some there are some 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 decisions where. I, Uh, that has changed systems a bit. So uh, I think um, you were seeing the. Um, uh, it was the first. It was the first appraisal that the Danish uh, um, health technology assessment uh, 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 authority should do, and um, that has been. I mean, it, it was a no. Uh, then later on, it was a yes to certain subpopulations, and then some more subpopulations. And of course, there was a huge debate about the fact that patients could get these therapy, a lot of this therapy, in other countries, uh, neighboring countries, uh, without problems. And then you were very rational in in in, in this country. Uh, in the UK, there's a uh, there was a very famous one on uh, on uh, on Herceptin, when Nice, which is the HTA body in, uh, in in the UK, said no to uh, to reception from the beginning, and then uh, and then later on, this decision was haunting them uh, for many many years. Uh, there was trials and all kinds of things. I mean, court trials. So um, uh, so there's 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 a lot of that that type of examples, but it's seldomly that you have an example where it's you know two therapies you could do two, only two things and then you choose one or you choose both or I mean you you seldomly have that so it's one at a time uh, decisions but every time it's a no it's a huge problem for everybody. Hmm. Yeah, I could imagine. Um, I'm I'm curious because. Whatever we do uh, on this side of things impacts our uh, our, our drug approvals. Uh, how is the cooperation inside a pharmaceutical company? Do you often see health economists working closely with uh, clinical developments in designing clinical trials, or are they very separate from each other? Typically, uh, typically, uh, uh, health economists uh, you would have. I mean, in big companies, you would have several departments. So, uh, so, and you would have a department that is that is dedicated to uh, to to development, and to ensuring that you can actually use the trials to uh, for uh, for HTA purposes uh, later on, and um, and they of course also work on assessing you know the potential of uh, of of uh, whatever you are you are you are developing um, in terms of its market size, its its likely price, and so forth. Um, so, um, so you have economists working there, and then uh, again, uh, when uh, when it's actually in the sort of HCA domain, so shortly after uh, uh, regulatory, and of course the work starts way before regulatory, but uh, <laughs> but I mean it ends only after. Yeah. It's actually interesting with regulatory and market access. So it used to be before you had uh, HCA uh, as a fourth hurdle. Um, you would only have the three hurdles, and then you were in the market. Um, today, we're seeing uh, a lot of a lot of uh, drugs going through regulatory quite fast. You know, in, in fast tracks, in priority reviews, with the uh, data from uh, from um, uh, from phase two trials that are maybe not controlled and so forth. And then at the same time, you have. On the other side, HTA, where you would say, you know, if you have no comparator, if you have a small population uh, of small trial population, then you have more uncertainty about the outcome. Um, so it's like a dilemma uh, that uh, that we see uh, between these two authorities. Uh, so it takes 
you know, it goes very fast through uh, through uh, um, regulatory affairs and then or regulatory uh, approval. And then in HCA, it takes very long time because there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that needs to be uh, assessed outside the trial in order to document the, the value of uh, um, of your of your new uh, drug. So, um, so that's a that's a uh, yeah, that's a dilemma, I think. Present. Yeah, it's not enough to focus on just your trials. You need to focus on the whole regulatory landscape. Yeah, because if you if you look at it from the from the point of the um, of the of the company, the owner of the of the IP, so I mean, there's a uh, there's 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 of course some um, some patents that uh, that that has a fixed duration, and if you spend you know more time in in uh, let's say two years before you actually have a reimbursed price, then uh, then that's time taken off um, of your patent. Mm. Um, and your market exclusivity. So, uh, so, so you gain some by getting uh, earlier regulatory, but uh, but you may end up losing it uh, in uh, in HTA. Now, Ole, I'm curious how is how do you see this field developing in the future? So. I don't know. Um, it's difficult for me to say exactly about the future, but um, I think uh, I think everything is moving very, very fast uh, in these years. Um, but in the present, I see that that I mean we have two movements really in uh, as I see medical medical development. So you have these large maybe population-based developments where it's about vaccines like COVID-19 or it's about obesity or cardiovascular diabetes, uh, huge patient populations that, that requires huge trials. Uh, and then you have minuscule populations where it's about, you know, personalized uh, medicine, it's about uh, checkpoints, it's about certain um, mutations, uh, CAR-T therapy, um, Rare, rare, uh, genetically uh, um, or inherited uh, disorders, and so forth. Um, and I think in uh, both of these actually would face, or they do face, uh, problems with HTA. So on the first one, it's because it has a huge, huge budget impact to implement something that uh, that basically brings the full population into indication. Uh, so that has a budget impact that is enormous. So even though a lot of these things are very, very cost effective, maybe society cannot really afford it. Um, and the other one is about is about the cost of of, uh, of, of of these technologies, where it's it's targeting maybe eight patients in a market like Sweden, and um, uh, and 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 the cost per patient is enormous, hmm. um, and that's uh, that, that's that's of course a, a, a big problem because it, it, it uh, a lot of these therapies they have down the line a lot of promise, um, but we haven't seen them, or at least uh, the HTA bodies would say, you know, we haven't seen that this actually works in the long run. So uh, so your trial is maybe one year uh, duration trial or three years duration trial. But um, but I mean, we're talking about a lifetime and uh, and payments are very, very high from the beginning. So uh, so that's, that's, um, that's a big challenge, I think. I think for both of these um, developments, we're going to see much more use of all the health information we actually have. So that's electronic medical records, it's registries, it's um, uh, it's uh, information we have on our uh, mobile devices, um, and that kind of thing. Where um, we will see these things being integrated much more in clinical trials. So, uh, so it's so so. I mean, you that that actually has the promise for the HTA part that it is about the real life because it's what we observe in a registry, for instance. Uh, so we're not going, doing a trial as such. We're doing a trial for some, but maybe we're repowering with with uh, with real world evidence. So that brings things a little bit together. And the same thing goes, of course, for the small, small populations where it's not maybe ethical to have a comparator arm, but where you will find a comparator arm in, uh, in real world uh, data. So, um, 
And one thing that's interesting, I think, is that regulatory authorities, at least the ones that I'm following, they are basically asking for this type of information to be included uh, already now. Uh, so, um, so I think that that um, if we started out with talking a little bit about uh, efficacy and effectiveness, now it's it's bringing each other to, uh, together a little bit because uh, because what is really efficacy and what is effectiveness when we are mixing data like this, and that's that's interesting also for the for the HTA uh, bodies, uh, and, uh, and going to be an interesting uh, thing to uh, to experience. Uh, absolutely. And this whole field is extremely data heavy. You need to have data from the different sources uh, and uh, in some quantities to be able to make uh, these kinds of assessments. And a lot of this data is sensitive because it's about people's health. So Ole, who compiles this data and conducts these analyses? So uh, that's researchers, but it's also uh, companies like the one I'm work working in. Um, where we're developing, I mean, for instance, if you take some of the big diseases there, you have you have trials that, that last for, for three years, but then you have a lifetime to project afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you can find information about how to do those projections in data already collected and use that information in order to say, you know, if we have, let's say, a blood pressure that is reduced by X, uh, then we would have a dose response uh, um, relationship that we can estimate in, uh, in data already uh, collected and where we then have 30 years of history uh, in order to say what does that mean in the longer term. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's how a lot of these things are, are going. Um, so, um, so it's, but it's of course also uh, in universities there are very, very famous, huge cohort studies uh, for those things um, that has been run by universities all over the world. Hmm. And Ole, maybe this is a, a nice segue to ask you more about uh, well, your career in general and uh, where you work now and how you got there. Yes, I mean, uh, so um, so I, I, I'm a university economist, so I studied actually finance and, uh, and econometrics. So that's the uh, sort of statistics uh, in economics. And, um, and then um, I was very lucky to, to get a chance to get a job in the central bank in Denmark, uh, but only a job interview. And I failed that interview. I didn't get the job. <laughs> and then I looked for the next one. <laughs> and that was at the Ministry of Health, uh, Department of Health, uh, Central Administration in Denmark. And, um, and I got that job. And then I found out that, that there you had, because we have registries up here in, uh, in, in all of the Nordic countries that are amazing. And uh, I found, you know, that I could do all kinds of very, very interesting uh, uh, health economics on, uh, on 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 these data. So I worked there for uh, for for some years, and then I got to the European Commission, where I was working on uh, on trying to um, to collect data from all over Europe, from the member states. And thank God there were only fifteen at the at the time. It was uh, some coordination job. I think today it must be much worse. <laughs> but um, but it was very interesting, and uh, I got to learn a lot of people all over Europe uh, who were wise in uh, in the same or interested in the same kind of. Uh, um, things as I. Um, then I, uh, some years later, joined uh, uh, joined the industry, and I, my first job was at Novo Nordisk, the uh, mine headquarter. So I worked there for about five years, and uh, then I did a consultancy um, afterwards, and uh, and had that for about four years. But uh, but it didn't really suit my life that much, uh, so um, uh, because I had small kids at the time and uh, that was not so good. But um, then I worked uh, at AppV, where I actually met you yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on market access uh, in in AppV. It was very interesting years, and uh, and then uh, then I've been at a, at a small company, or a smaller company, a biotech company um, within our oncology called Seagen. For uh, uh, for about three years, and now uh, now I'm a consultant again, and now it suits my life uh, very <laughs> much. <laughs> and I've also returned to uh, to all the data that I basically started out with, uh, which is uh, which is very interesting, I think. And that's that is really interesting, and you've seen it from many different perspectives, both from the mm -hmm. government side, from uh, yeah. 
the consulting side, from the life science side. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to have seen all these perspectives. Um, I think uh, actually when I joined uh, the industry, I was because uh, I was I was working. You know, it was very high level, uh, and I thought I found out that you know you impact. I think you impact health the most by working for the people who actually develops molecules that are, you know, injected or swallowed <laughs> by, by, uh, by, uh, by patients. Uh, so uh, the closer you get, it's, uh, it's, it's more impact. And that has, uh, that's been a driver for me. Um, I think uh, now returning to, uh, to working on, uh, on, on registry research, I think the quality of registries have just improved amazingly mm. compared to where it was. Uh, it's, I mean, it's nearly 25 years ago uh, that I started out on that. So, uh, so it's um, now we have you know laboratory data and uh, we have pathology data and we have you know all kinds of of of, of data. It's, it's it will be used a lot to uh, to do future therapies and to uh, to show the potential of future therapies and so forth. It's um, it's quite amazing times we're living in. Now we always ask the same question uh, of our guests in the end, um, and uh, you have seen many different aspects on the industry. But if I gave you a, a magic wand and asked you to make a wish that would change one thing in our industry, what would you wish for? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit outside of our industry, but uh, but it's on the on the, on the side of these HTA bodies, the regulators. Um, I think a lot of them that I've worked with have been have had this ethical uh, uh, grounds uh, that they were standing on, and you know it it, it, it was obvious that everybody that, that they actually wanted your therapy to go onto the market. Uh, they um, they were there in order to ensure that that patients were, were treated exactly in the same way and that we we were regulated uh, in such a way that the, that the patient would have chosen the same or the, at least the, the citizen would have chose, chosen the same. I think in, in some cases we have ACA bodies nowadays that, uh, that, have, that have been established only in order to cut costs, in order to, uh, to, to I mean, who would, who would state that, that their mission is to cut costs only instead of saying we are there in order to make sure that we you know do this in the right way that uh, that people have access to uh, to uh, to effective um, um, technology and uh, and then uh, then of course we're also here to ensure that there's a good balance between health and uh, cost um, so uh, so if I could if I could use the magic wand, I would definitely hope that we could find a more ethical, and I mean, some have found it, but a more ethical way of uh, of making these choices. Mm, that's that's a good one. Maybe the next evolution of this space is inviting some health philosophers in. If our listeners have any follow-up questions or want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? Yes, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Ole Henriksen. Uh, I work for, uh, for the Nordic Healthcare Group. Uh, the, the Danish office and um, my email is Ole, that's O-L-E, point Henriksen, that's H-E-N-R-I-K-S-E-N at N-H-G D-K dot D-K. So it's two times D-K to the, uh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. Awesome, Ole. Thank you so much. This has been very interesting. You're very welcome. Thank you very much that I could be part of this. You're listening to Transformation in Trials. If you have a suggestion for a guest for our show, reach out to Sam Parnell or Ivana Rosendale on LinkedIn. You can find more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or in any other player. Remember to subscribe and get the episodes hot off the editor.